Well, today I'm going to get started on this. Uh, three things you need to know about Christianity. Three things that you need to know about Christianity. We're in this series called Unshakable, and we're talking about how to build an unshakable faith. We're talking about how during difficult times, your faith can be strong. How during difficult times, your faith will stay true. We all go through difficult times. I was talking with the worship team backstage that suffering, we often look at suffering like a child rather than an adult. And let me just give you an example. Uh, when I was a child, I used to think that my parents were tormenting me. I used to think my parents were uh, really hurting me by making me do things that I did not want to do. They made me eat my vegetables when I wanted to eat ice cream. They made me do my homework when I wanted to play. They made me do chores and learn how to work when I did not want to do that. And for me, that was suffering. I mean, as a child, I suffered greatly, right? Uh, and they would correct me, and boy, that was just suffering. But the fact is, as an adult, I don't see that as suffering. I see that as training, as training. And the fact is, God, in his love, as a loving father, does the exact same thing for us. And so though you may be going through a difficult time, and sometimes we go through extremely difficult times, but I want you to know that God always has a plan in mind, and he always has your good in mind. The fact is, there are many times that it is only through suffering that we're able to draw closer to the Lord, closer in our relationship to him. Sometimes it is only through suffering we're able to grow. Sometimes it is only through suffering that these things are available to us and we go deeper in our relationship with God and we go higher in our standard of living uh, while we're representing Jesus Christ here on this earth. And so when we're talking about building an unshakable faith, we're not suggesting that you can ever get to the point where you never have doubts or where you never have problems or where you never have suffering, because you will have that. I guarantee you, as long as you live on this earth, until we are in heaven, in the presence of God, we will always have problems. We will always have difficulties. But if you will build your faith on the Word of God, and if you will build your faith on what the Bible teaches us, then your faith will become unshakable. And during the storms of life, during the difficult times in life, the times that you don't understand, you will be able to have an unshakable, unshakable faith. Amen? We want that as a church. We want that as individuals. Over the past several weeks, we've talked about, um, we talked about the Bible, first of all. We talked about how that you and I need to build an unshakable faith by trusting in the Word of God. We talked about God and how that the arguments for God in this culture that often doubts whether God exists. We gave you that. We talked about the character and the attributes of God. We talked about the purpose of God. Of course, we talked about Jesus Christ and how that he is necessary, must be at the center of all that we do in order to build the right kind of faith. Then we, last week, we talked about the church, how that the church is a gift of God to us and that you really will never reach the kind of spiritual maturity. You'll never reach uh, being the person that God wants you to be apart from the church. Of course, the church is filled with imperfect people. That's why we say here at Avalon Church, Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. If you ever find a church that is filled with perfect people, please don't join that church because you'll ruin it. The fact is, we're not into putting on the Sunday face here at Avalon Church. You know what the Sunday face is, right? You get up, you're already having a bad day because you overslept, and uh, you got the kids, they're arguing and fighting, and you do get the little ones dressed, and they're all so cute, and before you can even get them into the car, they ruin their outfit, and you have to change it, and uh, you're upset at your husband because he didn't help you with the kids as much as you thought he should, and uh, you're in the car, and you're at each other's throat. And the kids are in the back. Daddy, he won't stop touching me. And you about, not only you about have a heart attack, you about have a wreck because you're trying to reach in the back and slap somebody upside the head. Get on your side. Stop touching your brother. And the husband and wife are at each other and you're angry and your tires hit the parking lot of the church and a giant halo descends out of heaven down over your car and the first person you meet, they say, how are you today? All of our wonderful greeters, our 
parking attendants, our ushers, our wonderful members. They say, how are you today? And you go, fine, and you're a liar is what you are. Now, we're not talking about coming to church and giving too much information. You know what that is, right? When you ask somebody how they are doing and they begin to tell you the details of their hemorrhoids and all the stuff that's going on in their life, and that's too much information. We don't want to know that. Uh, just if you're having that kind of struggle, just say, just pray for me today. I don't feel too well. And uh, that will suffice. But the fact is we live in a culture where people want to pretend as if they don't have any problems in their life. They want to pretend as if they don't have any sin in their life. They are just, they wake up every morning at 4 a.m. to the sounds of angels' wings flapping and, and worship music. And all throughout the day, there's a little halo over their head and everywhere they go, it's just hunky-dory. It's just not really the reality of things, is it? And, and so what we want to do in this series is help you develop a faith that is unshakable. And today, rather than spending three different sermons on this, I want to talk to you about three things that you need to know about Christianity. These are three fundamental, foundational things that you need to know. Now, let me start by saying this. Right believing will lead to right living. That's really what we're doing in this series. Right believing, if you believe the right things, it's going to lead you to right living. It's going to lead you to strong living. When you believe in the Word of God, when you believe in God, when you believe in Jesus, what is that going to do for you? It's going to help you live right. Right believing leads to right living. Now, next week, I hope you'll be here this next weekend with the Good Friday uh, opportunity you have to observe communion. And then, of course, the Sunday morning services on Easter weekend. It's going to be fantastic. I hope you will sit in one and, ser and serve in one. Worship in one and serve in one. The fact is, if you will do that, it'll be a big help to us. And you'll be able to minister to people and be a part of people that are having their lives changed and coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And boy, that gets me excited thinking about the possibility of that and what's going to happen next week. So don't miss that. Well, today I want to talk about these three essential beliefs that are going to help you get deeper and stronger in your faith, in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's the first thing. We're just going to jump right in. Number one, Christianity believes in one triune God. In other words, we believe that there's one God, but that He is a trinity. It is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now you say, well, why is that necessary? Have you ever wondered that? Why is it necessary for there to be three persons in one God? It's very difficult even to understand. We try to illustrate it by saying like there's an egg and it's got a shell and a white and a yolk. Um, I don't think that quite does it justice. People say, well, you can use it like water. It can be in a liquid state, it can be in a gas state, or it could be in a solid state, but it's still water. And, and whereas those are good attempts, I'm not sure that you and I can fully understand the Trinity. The fact is, Without the Trinity, the gospel is not possible. And that is why the Trinity is so important. And if you ever get around those that want to say, well, we don't really believe in the Trinity, you need to hold that person, that belief at arm's distance. You know why? Because without the gospel, I mean, I'm sorry, without the Trinity, the gospel is not possible. Have you ever thought about that? Um, we're going to read some passages of Scripture in the Bible where we see Father, Son, and Spirit together. Now, why could the gospel not be possible apart from the Trinity? Well, very simple. Because if the Son, who was in eternity past, a part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, they were in perfect harmony, they were in perfect fellowship, they were in perfect love, they had absolutely no needs. God didn't create this universe in you and me because He needed to have fellowship. He already had perfect fellowship and love with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the fact is, God, being a spirit, cannot die. And in order for our sins to be paid for, there needed to be a human representative as well as a divine representative. And the only possible way that that could happen was for Jesus to become that human representative. He was already divine, and as a result of that, he was able to die on the cross in our place for our sins. And without the Trinity, the gospel is not possible. 
Let me read you some passages that will help you and hopefully deepen your belief in this. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, what does that mean? It means that there is one triune God. Even though there are three persons or personages or however you want to say that, there is one God. That's what the Bible tells us. The idea of the Trinity, though, began uh, in the Old Testament. In fact, it began in the very first chapter um, of the Bible, where the Bible talks about uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without void and form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hover, hovered over the face of the water. So you see the Father and the Spirit there in the first couple verses of the Bible. And then in, uh, uh, look what it says in Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Do you notice a couple of words in there that give you this idea that God is one God but three persons? Yes, our image, let us make man. We already see in the first chapter of the Bible that this, this truth is very, very important. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. And this is after they had sinned and partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, uh, they are like one of us in knowing good and evil. And then Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, and I love this because God calls every one of us. The Bible is very clear about that. The Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And, and in other words, uh, he will call you, but he won't always call you if you always reject him. And there comes a point where God is going to say, okay, there you go. God is not going to force you to go to heaven. If you want to go to hell, you can. If you want to reject God, you can. God will not force you to go to heaven. But I love what God does here. He says, uh, talking about Isaiah. Isaiah had been called by God. God was drawing him in the same way that God will draw you. The first time I ever felt God drawing me, I was six years old. Uh, my dad had just recently been saved, and uh, our family had started going to church, and we went to this uh, tent meeting. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those before, the sawdust uh, trail and the chairs and everything. That's kind of fun. And uh, so we were in this tent meeting, and uh, the preacher was preaching, and during the invitation, he called for people to come forward, and no one moved but me. I was six years old. I was the only person that came forward. And I did not know what was happening. I just knew that all of a sudden I began to cry. And I began to be drawn toward the front. I wanted somebody to pray with me. And a woman came up and put her arm around me and just patted me on the shoulder and said, it's going to be okay, buddy. And she never shared the gospel with me. I believe with all of my heart I would have been saved at that moment had somebody given me the good news. And it was only a couple of years later, at eight years old, we had gone to church on Wednesday night. Once my dad got saved, once we got involved, we were all in kind of people. And I love that. My dad eventually became a missionary, became a pastor. And uh, what a wonderful influence he's been on my own life. And I got called to the ministry as well. Uh, but there I was, an eight-year-old boy after church on a Wednesday night. And my mother, she always prayed with me before I went to bed. And she just asked me a simple question. She said, Richie, would you like to be saved? And I broke down. I began to weep. And I knew that God was drawing me to himself. And as an eight-year-old boy, I knew that I needed a Savior. Now, to be honest, you know, when you look at an eight-year-old boy, how many sins has an eight-year-old boy really committed? I mean, I knew that I had told lies. I knew that I had done wrong. And I knew that uh, I had sin in my life. And at that moment, God drew me to himself. Thank God that I responded. Maybe you need to respond. Maybe God is drawing you, not just for salvation, but maybe he's drawing you to himself to serve him. Maybe there's some area in your life he's dealing with you about. I've been through that many times in my life. As a teenage boy, I began to be drawn toward uh, the ministry. I did not want to go into the ministry. I thought that was the last thing I possibly wanted to do. I wanted to do something with sports or basketball or something. It, the last thing I wanted to do was go into the ministry. But I knew God was drawing me. Maybe God's drawing you. Maybe God's drawing you to serving him better committing some part of your life, giving up some area of your life that is displeasing to him. 
But we all know the drawing of God. But listen to what Isaiah said. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Us. That's God talking. And he is drawing uh, Isaiah, who became a great Old Testament prophet and wrote the book of Isaiah. Um, this is, we further see the Trinity in the New Testament. Look in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is after Jesus was resurrected from the grave and he was talking to his disciples and here's what he said. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity right there in that great commission verse. Matthew chapter three, verses 16 and 17. And this is uh, one of the, the most clear passages that we see the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit together in one place. Here's what it said. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And in that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. So you have the Son and the Spirit and a voice from heaven that said, this is my Son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. You see, right there, we see the Trinity right in that passage where Jesus was baptized. So I hope you'll trust in the Trinity. I hope you'll trust in one triune God and understand that it, understanding that, believing that will help you build your faith. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Christianity is certain of the return of Christ. The return of Christ. Now, I realize that for many of us, we don't think about this enough. And I have to be um, really open and honest with you as a pastor. I talked to our staff about this week. I feel like that I have failed in a way and that I have not talked about this enough. The fact is Jesus came the first time, but the glorious, glorious truth is he is coming again. And once he comes again, he is not going to return back. Well, he brings heaven with him. And the fact is, when he comes again, he is going to set up his reign here. And he is going to rule and reign forever. And we will enter into that eternity in the presence of God and the presence of Jesus. What a beautiful, beautiful, comforting thing to know that no matter what you're going through, Jesus is coming again. Jesus will return. So as a church... We believe in the return of Christ. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about us. He's talking about believers. Uh, when he came the first time, the Bible describes him as a lamb. Came as the lamb of God. And he was very meek and gentle. He was very strong in many ways, obviously. Um, he uh, did not allow the temple to be turned into a house of thieves. He turned over tables and made a whip out of cords and drove the thieves out. So he was strong, but he came as the Lamb of God. He completely surrendered to death. He surrendered to death on the cross as the Lamb of God. But friend, if you picture Jesus in eternity as a gentle, meek lamb, you need to read the book of Revelation. He is coming again, but he is not coming as a lamb. He is coming as a lion. And he is going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. And I love how the Bible describes him. Do you know that if you really, really look in the book of Revelation and look at the imagery, and, and there's a lot of imagery, there's a lot of metaphor in the book of Revelation. You need to understand that. Some of it has already been fulfilled. Uh, the, John was writing to a first century uh, group of Jewish believers, okay? So you have to understand the context in which he was writing. They would understand that some of this was going on around them at the time. But when Jesus comes again, he's coming as a lion. Do you know how that he comes uh, riding on a white horse? And I love this. The Bible says that, he, <laughs> this, is, this is kind of funny to me. He dips his vesture, his garments in the blood of his enemies, 
Now, I've never seen anybody do that. That's Rambo bad, all right? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger never had anything on him. When he comes again, he's not coming like a gentle lion, he, a gentle lamb. He is coming as a roaring lion, and he is going to defeat his enemies with the word of his mouth. And praise God, he will set up eternity, and we will worship him forever and ever. And it is that point there will be no more sin. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more sadness. There will be no more pain. There will be no more death. And we will enter into the eternal uh, day of our Lord and our God. Hallelujah. That is going to be a glorious, glorious day. Speaking of the second coming of Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Um, the metaphor that Paul was using here, or that he was alluding to, was very common in that day because when a king would come to a city, a contingent of, of that city would go out to welcome him, and then they would meet him, and they would come back to the city together. And so as uh, God is describing here, the, we would call that the rapture, but I believe the rapture and the second coming are simultaneous, that when Jesus comes, we are going to go out and meet him. Those that are in the grave already, they're going to rise first. Why? Because they're six feet under, that's why. And uh, we, they, we're not going to get a head start on them, all right? And they're gonna, we're going to meet the Lord together, and we're going to come back for him to rule and reign. I love that. That's exciting. The fact is, when Jesus comes again, it says that we will be always with the Lord. I love the angel and what he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus had resurrected. He had appeared numerous times to the disciples. He appeared to Peter to get Peter back on board. He appeared to James, his, his agnostic half-brother, that had said, oh no, Jesus is crazy. He's not the son of God. But he appeared to his brother James who wrote the book of James and became the pastor at the church at Jerusalem. And uh, he appeared to over 500 people at one time. There were multiple times he appeared to the women. And the truth is, he ascended back to heaven. And here's what the angel said. Look at what he said. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus is going to come again and we're going to see him. Thank God. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. In other words, those that have rejected him. He, he, obviously, he's referring to uh, the soldiers and the Jewish leaders that put him to death, but he really is referring to all sinners, those that did not receive Christ, even those who had pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And then at Mark, chapter 13, verse 32 and 33, excuse me. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Now, I'm assuming that probably all throughout church history, since Jesus died on the cross and resurrected from the grave, I'm assuming that there have always been those that want to tell you when he's coming. When I was growing up, I heard at least about seven or eight different preachers that had figured out exactly when Jesus, you know, was coming again. And I, even as a little boy, I'm like, I'm, but the Bible says that no one knows except for the Father. And I can tell you this, when someone says, hey, I know Jesus is coming on this date, there's one thing I know, he ain't coming on that date. You know why? Because the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. There are, there are many, many things that can be confusing about the last times, the things to come. And uh, I'm going to be teaching on that sometime in the future uh, about the book of Revelation, how we look at that, the, the different viewpoints of that. Just understand this. The book of Revelation is meant to be an encouragement to you. And here's what the book of Revelation is about. It is about the church. It is about the fact that Jesus wins 
and that he saves those that believe in him and is about the fact that once he comes again and we enter into the eternal state, it is going to be eternal bliss from now on. And the other point is that God will judge the nations and he will, he will judge those that have rejected him. That's really all the book of Revelation is about. And so it can be a great encouragement to you, especially chapters 4 and 5, when they begin to read about Jesus, when they begin to talk about Jesus, that he is the, the lamb that was slain. He's worthy to open the scroll. He is the one that is to be worshipped. And all throughout those two chapters, he is uh, praised in heaven by millions and even billions of angels and all the people of the world that have received Christ. And it says, you are worthy, O Lord. And he is worthy. He is worthy. Well, the last and final thing I want to talk to you about is that Christianity is sure of an afterlife. In other words, when you die, that's not all there is. I know some people believe that. They believe that the moment you die, that's it. Nothing else. But nothing can be further from the truth. Not only does the Bible teach this, and people have believed this for for thousands and thousands of years, and have known in their heart, just in the way that you can know from general revelation uh, in nature, you can know that there's a God. And so heaven is real. Heaven is real. I believe hell is real. Followers of Jesus will live forever in a new body. Listen to what it says in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. Is anybody looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth? No more curse, no more pain, no more death. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward never to have to make another visit to, to a family and console them on a sick loved one or on a loved one that died. I'm looking forward to that day. But he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth earth had passed away. And I believe this kind of indicates that God remakes creation. I don't believe the earth itself is completely destroyed. I believe he remakes it and puts it back to the original Edenic order. And by Edenic, I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. And uh, in the Garden of Eden, when God created everything, there's one thing he said after every day of creation and after everything he created on each of those days. You know what he said? God saw that it was good. It was good. And God is going to return the earth and us to our original order. And I love that. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away. For there's no longer any sea. Once again, I believe that's probably metaphor because sea in the Bible represent bad things that happen in life. Not going to be more bad stuff happening in heaven, thank God. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne room saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he shall live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be with their God. By the way, that is where, you say, where is heaven? It's where God is. I can't pinpoint a location on a map for you. But I do know this, that when God is with his people, that is heaven and will be that way forever. And he shall wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. You see, we believe that there is a heaven. We believe that your soul will live somewhere forever. We believe that your body will live somewhere forever because of the resurrection of the body. And that even after you die, if it's a long time before Jesus comes again, once he comes, you're going to be resurrected with a resurrected body that is completely uh, without uh, pain or limitation like we have now. Not going to be getting older, not going to be getting uglier, not going to be getting fatter, not going to be getting less in shape, not going to be not able to walk or run like you used to. It's going to be a perfect resurrected body. Thank God. Uh, for, if you want to learn a little more about heaven, I encourage you to go uh, on our website, avalonchurch.net. Listen to my series uh, from 2017 on heaven, and it'll be a, an encouragement to you. But we also believe that in the afterlife, heaven is real, but hell is also. And those that reject Christ will, by definition, be in hell. You say, what's the definition of Hell. The definition of hell is eternal separation from God. 
eternal separation from God. And can you imagine the torment of that? Can you imagine the darkness of that? Uh, the Bible talks about hell being a place of darkness and fire. I believe the fire most likely is, uh, is metaphorical and it's, it represents the judgment of God like fire does in the Bible. And the fact is, it is going to be painful and real and tormenting and worse than anything you can imagine. You don't want to be there. You don't want to go there. Second Thessalonians 1, 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. You see, you don't realize that everything in this earth has got God's glory in it, even though it's a cursed earth. The beauty of a sunset, the beauty of the beach, the beauty of the mountains, the joy of a wonderful meal, the joy of smelling a beautiful flower, the joy of relationship, the joy of a husband and wife making love and loving each other, the joy of having children, the joy of looking at things and listening to music and being able to enjoy, enjoy art. There is so much joy because of the presence of God. Think of if all of that is removed, what is that place like? I think it can only be described as hell. Hell. No love. Pure hate. No relationships. No joy. Hatred and pain and suffering. Revelation 21, 8, but for, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, moral sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. By the way, everybody's told a lie. What do you call a person that murders one person? We call them a murderer, right? What do you call a person that breaks and enters and steals and they get caught and they get put in prison? What do we call that person? We call them a thief. What do you call a person that tells one lie? We don't like that, do we? The truth of the matter is he's talking about those who have not received Christ because every person in this room has been guilty of some of the sins on this list. I know I have. And so what God is talking about is those that are not in relationship with Christ, they will have their portion in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You see, here's what the Bible describes. When you follow Jesus, you die once and you live twice. You live from a physical birth, but you also live from a spiritual birth or rebirth and you're able to live forever once your resurrected body comes together in a physical body forever and ever. What joy. But if a person does not receive Christ, that person lives once and dies twice. The Bible calls hell or the lake of fire the second death. Then he goes on uh, in Matthew 25, 31, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20 to 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, God made you an eternal soul, and you must choose. You must choose where you're going to go. God will not force you to go to heaven. He's just simply not that way. But he will answer your prayer if you call on him to save you. He promises that he will, and I believe that he does. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone in the room today and everyone watching online that you would help us, oh God. Lord, help us not only to believe, but to embrace the Trinity. God, help us to know that Jesus is coming again. Help us to live in light of the fact that you could come at any time. Help us to know that we need to live in light of the fact that there is an eternity. There is an eternal state. And God, I pray that you'd help any that are not in the family of God, <clears throat> any that have not been put right with the Father through Jesus. I pray that you'd help them to be saved today. Now, I'm going to just ask you to keep your head bowed for a moment. And I'm going to ask you, number one, how many of you would say, Pastor, I'm confident, not because of me, not because I'm good, but I'm confident because of Jesus that I've received him as my Savior. And I know I'm going to heaven when I die. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that? A lot of people. Most people, in fact. You can put them down. I wonder if you'd be honest and say, Pastor, you know, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. Or maybe you are sure that you don't know Jesus. But either way, you'd say, I'm not confident that if I died today, that I would spend eternity with the Father. 
And I want to get that settled today. Would you raise your hand, anybody like that, just high enough and long enough for me to see it? High enough and long enough for me to see it. Those of you that are joining us online, I would challenge you in the same way that if you have not received Christ or if you're not sure that right now, click that button on your screen and pray to receive Christ. You might say something like this, Dear Father, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and He died on the cross for my sins. And I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin and to save me right now. Take me to heaven when I die. Help me to live for you on this earth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.